Good morning. Thank you, uh, <coughs> Mike and Avasis, for inviting me to talk today. Um, <coughs> I got a little scratchy throat, too, so you guys have to enjoy two of these. I'm going to talk about cervical alignment and touch on some of the things that some of the talks have already gone over a little bit, a little bit of stuff from yesterday, and, and then uh, I think we'll do some cases, I think, after that. So here's my disclosures, nothing to do with this talk. So we're going to talk about the historical significance of alignment in general. I think, um, as we've learned in the last few years, there's been a big discussion in the lumbar spine and the thoracal lumbar spine about alignment, something that the deformity surgeons have been talking about for, for a very long time has now trickled down into the degenerative uh, discussion, and I think that's also helped push our understanding of alignment in the cervical spine, and what we really need to kind of figure out is, is how clinically relevant all, all of that is. We'll go over some of the cervical parameters and then, and then talk about some of that clinical significance. So as we know, goals of spine surgery, we, we decompress if we can only. Uh, we fuse and or stabilize in situations where there's deformity or instability that's either pre-existing or we create. And we have to try and preserve or restore alignment. And, and why is that important? We know that poor alignment does uh, equate to disability. Um, we have to uh, compensate for that anatomic deformation, and that compensation either happens throughout other portions of our spine, above and below, uh, where we structurally fix the spine, or through other joints, our knees, our hips. Uh, you know, we see how people have compensated and how disabled they become. There's a mechanical disadvantage, and that challenges our balance mechanisms. And when we deviate from this zone, uh, this stable zone, this cone of balance, we know that there's an increased muscular and energy usage, and, and this then affects the patient more dramatically on top of the actual physical structural deformity that's been created. We know that when we lose global alignment, when that plumb line shifts anteriorly, we get increasing disability. I think we've, we've touched on that now uh, between some of the talks last night, and, and we're pretty confident in understanding that that is maybe one of the biggest struggles patients have is when they have a sagittal malalignment, they're pushed forward, and they have increasing disability. Lumbar kyphosis has been shown to, to uh, markedly disable the patient if not addressed uh, uh, at the time of uh, surgical treatment. We know that loss of lordosis especially is poorly tolerated and has a direct effect on this disability. As that kyphosis increases, as I discussed, we see that our ODI scores uh, reflect that, that, that the patients really struggle with their ability to function on a normal everyday basis. It may not be a physical pain that they're dealing even in those situations, but it goes back to that, that stable zone, that muscular usage and fatigue that happens for these patients in being able to maintain an upright position. So we, we've seen this in the lumbar spine. Patient can, can a, a get to an upright neutral position in the office, but they say that as the day goes on, they just they can't hold that position and they fall forward. And we know that the causes of sagittal balance are, are many. You know, we, we have uh, you know, degenerative ca cases, scoliosis, post-laminectomy, uh, as we'll talk about a little bit in the cervical spine, fractures, de deformities of, from trauma, from osteoporosis, from pseudoarthrosis. Um, but the most common causes are degenerative and our own iatrogenic causes, which comprise this. So we can understand that we need to preserve and restore in the lumbar spine. We know that sagittal balance is directly correlated to that clinical outcome. And we know that that can increase the patient's risk of reoperation. Maybe one of the most uh, important factors is reoperation. And when, we're, when we malign the patient, they're up to 10 times more risky. So what do we measure in the cervical spine? So we, we have a pre-existing understanding now, both in degenerative and deformity, that alignment of the spine is very important, not only for patient satisfaction, for disability, but also for reoperation. Uh, you know, adjacent segment disease and the need to address that other structural deformity. So how do we then translate that to the cervical spine? Can we translate that in the cervical spine? So Ames has looked at this and, and published a few papers which I think are pretty uh, helpful in at least trying to identify the parameters that we look at. We know that when performing decompressive surgery, for, for example, for uh, myelopathy, we need to look into that cervical kyphosis and we need to look at that cervical sagittal imbalance. So the, two, the, the C2 to C7 SVA is, is something that uh, we'll get into a little bit more, but has been identified to be one of the more important factors in addressing whether or not this can be done anteriorly, posteriorly, or if a deformity needs to be addressed. Other parameters we look at when we're, when we're discussing cervical deformity is the chin-brow vertical angle, 
um, and the regional cervical lordosis, which can be, can be measured. And then we know that patients with poor alignment in this can, can also develop those compensatory mechanisms. They develop hyperlordosis of the subaxial segments of the spine. Um, I, I, I think we've all seen patients in where we do a posterior surgery, if they have a really positive SVA, uh, sometimes the muscles, if the fascial closure wasn't very um, uh, you know, meticulously closed, those muscles will translate anteriorly, further forcing that person ant uh, more anterior, and they are miserable from pain in the neck and, and their inability to look up straight, though we've addressed the, the cord pathology perfectly in, in some of those cases. He also tried to uh, develop a deformity classification. So I, I think classification systems, as we know, have been, uh, there, are, there are several uh, that, are, that are in the thoracolumbar spine. They're helpful in, in things, in situations in which we're trying to discuss amongst ourselves uh, how to I'd put patients in subsets and, and then identify our, if our treatments are effective as a group. So I think it's a, a deformity classifications are helpful in us trying to be consistent with comparing apples to apples. Uh, how it translates clinically and how that makes your decision making in the cervical spine is yet to be seen, but um, right now I think it's, a, it's important to identify a deformity classification. So in 2015 he put, put out the deformity classification that, that you see here. It looks, like the, it looks at the sagittal deformity uh, and identifies the location, whether it's primarily in the cervical spine, if it's at the cervical thoracic junction, if it's a primarily thoracic deformity, if there's a coronal deformity um, uh, involved in that as well. And then looking at some markers, horizontal gaze, the SVA, the cervical lordosis, and then myelopathy scales as well. And, and that can allow us to sort of compare apples to apples when we're looking at subsets of, of patients. So, so what are some of these cervical parameters? How do we measure those? So we have the chin-brow vertical angle, the T1 slope, the cervical sagittal vertical axis, and, and cervical lordosis. So the chin-brow vertical angle. So this is measured between a line from the brow to the chin to the vertical while the patient stands. And, and the key is making sure that the patient's hips and knees are extended. So you see that the, the image on the left there is pretty dramatic uh, uh, CBVA, but the, you know, th there's a whole range that we can find as you identify this, but it's very important making sure the patient's standing up with his knees and, and hips as extended as possible. Now this is associated with improved gaze, obviously, ambulation, their ability to perform ADLs. We have not defined what's normal, but we have, in retrospective reviews, identified that if you're outside of this plus or minus 10 degree range, that clinically patients are reporting poorer outcomes. Uh, and so for right now, that's the range that we have to work with, uh, which I think is intuitively makes sense to us, uh, but a normal has not been, been uh, identified. Now T1 slope, I think, is very helpful in helping us determine if there's deformity regionally or globally. How many people routinely get full spine films even for their cervical patients? Yeah, not, not many. I mean, I, 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 logistically, that doesn't always make a lot of sense even in certain offices. But one thing that helps me, and I think the, the literature is beginning to support, is looking at this T1 uh, tilt. So if it falls outside of that range of, of what's been identified as 13 to 25 degrees, maybe some consideration should be to get a full spine film because it may be identifying that there is a thoracolumbar deformity that's at play that you're not, uh, that you're not uh, recognizing. That may or may not make a difference to your clinical decision if it's a one-level disc herniation in the cervical spine, but if you're doing a more dramatic surgery uh, that, that is uh, a C2 to T1 or T2 or something like that, there may be some consideration in, in trying to address some of the deformity because, again, we're seeing results of, as we'll talk about, as, of patients who have a, a, a CSVA that, that is way too anterior. They don't clinically do as well. And that angle, as you measure it, is the slope, is the angle between the horizontal line and that superior end plate of, of T1. Sometimes it's difficult to see T1, and you can, you can maybe translate it to C7. Now the CSVA, that's the distance between the plumb line dropped from the centroid of C2 and the posterior superior corner of C7. And um, you know, drawing that distance, uh, you know, any can be two centimeters, four centimeters, that helps you kind of help determine whether, how forward that the, the head, the cervical spine is to the rest of the spine's axis. Now, uh, this has been looked at. Several researchers have looked at this, and they looked at the, the health rate of quality scores on patients with multi-level posterior cervical fusions. And they, they got standing radiographs to assess that true alignment, and they found that disability increased significantly when the CSVA was more positive. 
and they narrowed it down to about four centimeters. So there was a correlation between a CSVA of four centimeters or greater and worse outcomes on the NDI. So that, that kind of uh, helps us, again, if you're seeing a big slope, there's a big CSVA, is there another deformity present here? Is that something that's even reasonably addressable or, or at least counselable for the patient? Cervical lordosis, this is, is maybe the least helpful of the, of the parameters because there's a range there that's pretty wide and it does, you have to take that into account. Just like lumbar lordosis, we, we're realizing it's not an absolute number we have to go after, but how that lumbar lordosis is, is balanced in comparison to the, the pelvic incidence. I think there's a scenario here in the cervical spine that's similar. So you have to correlate that to the, to the SVA, but this can be defect, affected again by thoracic deformity, and, and seeing a high T1 slope may help push you to that. We know that in order to address lordosis, we can do this anteriorly. And we have a lot of different techniques. There, there are people now that are doing more of a hyperlordotic uh, cervical cages as well. But to gain about a, a 15 millimeter improvement in your CSVA, you need about 25 to 30 degrees of implant lordosis, at least according to some studies, to, at two operative levels. So that's a lot of lordosis to get out of the cervical spine. And we know that even if you put in, in, in the lumbar spine a 25, 30 degree a, a lift cage, you're not always getting 30 degrees. You're, you're getting maybe half of that. So you know, these are some considerations. We're using our implants now a lot to help us um, gain uh, alignment correction without doing the big dramatic surgeries. Uh, but they're not always giving us everything that we think they're giving us. So we have to keep that in, 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 uh, in account. So we know from an outcome perspective, and in the, in the, in, in the previous talk touched on this, on the kyphotic spine. So the, this, a lot of this literature has come out of Japan. They looked at this with laminoplasty specifically, and they pushed it towards 13 degrees or more of kyphosis. You can still do a posterior-based operation and get away with it, whereas if it was more than that, the neurological outcome was worse. Does anyone do a laminoplasty in anybody less than neutral or lordotic? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've never even tried to push this, this, uh, <laughs> this number here, but uh, at least in the literature, that's what they're pushing. The more recent literature is even saying eight degrees, which I think, again, intuitively makes sense to us. We're not going to see that cord drift back if the patient remains kyphotic and the cord is draped over the anterior compression. Now, some more interesting numbers that are coming out as far as looking at whether or not you need to do an anterior posterior base based on that alignment is, is how severe that compression is, whether it's a disc herniation or through kyphosis. So there, uh, Taniyama has looked at this modified K-line. Uh, he took the center of the spinal cord at the C2 level and C7 level and then drew a line from that toward to the, whatever's compressing it. So in this particular case, at C5-6, there's a disc bulge, for example, compressing anteriorly to the cord. If that distance was less than four millimeters, then clinically patients had a better outcome neurologically if you did a posterior-based operation. Whereas if that distance was greater than four meters, whether the compression was, was uh, severe enough or the kyphosis was present, they found that the upper extremity improvement was less. So these are small numbers that they're comparing it to, but it's looking at alignment in the cervical spine in a little bit of a different way and maybe for us to try and understand you know, whether or not we need to be going anteriorly more. In that case with the OPLL, I would have gone posterior all day, every day, never even thought about going, think about going uh, anterior. I, I did a talk in, in uh, Europe uh, last year. I, I was the only American surgeon. Every single European surgeon on, on a case very similar to that was anterior all day. They, were, they, they thought I was a crazy person to be the only one going posterior. They talked about the hill shape, uh, size of lesion, and the neurologic outcome. They're doing 20 level corpectomies like crazy over there. I mean, it's unbelievable. They're just dancing in CSF. The, the, in my hands, there's no chance I would go anterior on that, but it's just there's still a philosophical divide, even internationally now, on when we would go anterior, when we would go posterior. Now, alignment of the cervical spine, maybe perhaps most importantly for us on everyday degenerative stuff, can affect the adjacent segment. We know that patients who do not have adequate lordosis or have a positive CSVA are showing higher levels of adjacent segment disease. This has been shown in a few studies now. The numbers of these studies are small, but I think intuitively that makes sense to us as well. And that perhaps this adjacent segment phenomenon, which is related to natural history as well as the presence of the fusion, may also be related to the presence of uh, malalignment. I think we can all agree that that exists in the lumbar spine. When, when someone has a flat back, their, their next level breaks down much quicker than what we would have thought or anticipated. So maybe understanding that uh, can help us decide whether or not we should be more or less aggressive about this. Adjacent level ossification, we see that. When patients have 
a kyphotic spine, we're seeing a higher level of this adjacent level ossification. And, and several uh, people have shown that that ossification can alter the mechanics at that level, which can then alter the, create more degeneration, which can le lend itself to more adjacent segment disease. So uh, either a kyphosis, or and they've talked about that, putting a shorter plate on. These are all relevant things we need to look at when we're addressing the spine, even if doing a fusion to address that deformity. <coughs> And then in arthroplasty, just really quick, we, we've tried to assess this. We've looked at preoperative alignment, range of motion as a predictor of success. And uh, I think we've all, and, and as, as we talked about earlier, putting a, a, a disc in a kyphotic patient, well, we've shown to increase the failure of that disc and or adjacent segment. We haven't really quantified what's acceptable. And that's, we're, we're, ga we're, we're just guessworking a little bit on this stuff, but we know that, um, it, it, it's something that we need to quantify a little bit better to, to really enhance our results, and maybe more and more of us would adopt a, a, a cervical disc replacement. We, we, the, the one study that is beginning to show a little bit of this that I at least found was this T1 slope again, and, and they showed an increased operative adjacent segment and index level segment, specifically with the Brine disc, if they had a high T1 slope. And, and so that these numbers are small. They're beginning to look at this, and I think there's going to be a lot to come as far as alignment and, and disc arthroplasty. So how do we use all of this? I, I think we always need to get upright standing x-rays. I think even sitting x-rays can give us a false assessment of alignment. And then we should consider full length films if you have a high T1 slope. At the very least to counsel the patient that they may, their, their outcome may not be as good as, as we would have hoped or expected or that they have another pathology that may need to be addressed at some point. CSVA corrections may be the most, maybe the most strongly correlated to clinical outcome, which makes sense to us. We, we saw all that stuff with sagittal alignment in the lumbar spine. And this may affect your surgical plan if the studies continue to support its relevance. So right now we're in the early phases of this, but as this comes on, you know, as this continues to be published on, I think it may, it may be something that we have to change how we think of things. And we need to further look at specifically at the clinical outcome and, and, and this adjacent segment phenomenon with the cervical disc arthroplasty in relation to kyphosis. We need to quantify that better. Thanks.